Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel and today uh, I'm going to be talking about the books that I've read this week and um, this has been a pretty, pretty productive reading week partly because I've had a lot of moments of being on various forms of transport or walking around with audiobooks or what have you. Uh, so yeah, here are the books that I've been been reading. It's been a, a fun little fun little set. Um, I'll add as well into this that uh, uh, you know, a bit of these are sort of bookery. I'll be doing separate booker reviews on um, on those two. Uh, but let's let's get started. Either way, first up, I read Dermot Hester's "Nothing Ever Just Disappears: Seven Hidden Stories, uh, Histories Rather," and this is a non-fiction book that really delves into. Um, a really interesting uh, way of looking at things, I think. So sort of taking sort of uh, histories of, of various queer people from uh, from the last sort of few hundred years and particularly looking at the places that they lived in and kind of how those places both informed their work and their lives, but also how their work and lives informed the place that they lived in as well. And so there's this really interesting thing that goes on. And, um, you know, the beginning part of the book talks a bit about Derek Jarman, who is a sort of personal hero of mine in many, many ways. And for me, going to Prospect Cottage was kind of like a, a, a pilgrimage of some form. It, it felt so powerful to go there. So to see it so lovingly rendered in this book is, is a really beautiful thing. Um, but I think some of the other parts that are covered in this book are also just so fascinating. So somebody like Josephine Baker, sort of half of who you can see there, um, you know, um, she lived in Paris and Paris was also this sort of, um, this place that that informed a lot of other things that were going on at the same time. And I, I never really made some of the connections that that is present in this book before. Um, so some, some of the connections that really were interesting for me with the fact that we have somebody like uh, Josephine Baker um, revolutionising parts of, of how people are seen and particularly, you know, she's this really interesting figure as this sort of uh, black American woman who's moved to, the, to, to France, but is also, you know, coming up against the sort of the racism of the time and, and sort of and all of those sorts of things. But she's also this performer who is tantalising audiences and she's also quite sexualized and she's also fairly openly bisexual and so she's this really interesting figure but then add to that at the same time there would be for example Shakespeare and Company the bookshop that was publishing things like Ulysses um, and also there was this sort of, um, sort of coterie of of, um, of queer women who were living and working around there particularly in the arts and particularly around books um, you've also got somebody like James Baldwin who was who had sort of moved to France around, you know, sort of similar-ish time. And so you've got these really fascinating kind of things of people sort of almost on top of each other in ways that I'd not previously considered. And it's one of those really rare gems, I think, of a book where um, you're reading about these people's lives and the the first thing you want to do after you finish the book is to go and research all these people's lives and read the books that are referenced in this book and, and all of those sorts of things. So I think it's a real triumph um, and just an absolutely glorious, glorious book that I I loved. I just thought this was stunning, um, really beautifully written and just really cleverly done in terms of how it thinks about spaces, um, I think, um, and some sort of fairly diverse ones as well, even Jersey um, in the Channel Islands, which is sort of somewhere that probably isn't written about all that much. Um, so it's really fascinating to, to see. Next up for a local book uh, club, I read Pamela Frankow's um, A Wreath for the Enemy. And this is an author and book I hadn't heard of at all uh, before before the book club sort of chose it. Um, and she sort of mostly wrote, I think, sort of around the 50s. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is written in 54. And so it's so interesting because, yeah, she's this sort of author who hasn't sort of been more broadly known, I think, as well. Um, but this is such an interesting book of, of sort of delving into some some really deep character work I think um we have our central character um Penelope I believe her name is I'm terrible with remembering anybody's names ever uh Penelope yeah and Penelope um we <laughs> starts off this book writing this list of people she hates and the things she hates and she has this set of neighbors who she refers to as the smugs um and you know all of these she, it sort of starts like it's going to be this Muriel Spark novel of her, her listing every sort of character trait of somebody that's awful um 
And actually what I think this book deepens into is this really heartfelt and cleverly observed book around love and around loss and around so many other things. So the first part is narrated by Penelope. The second part is narrated by um, a, a sort of somebody she knows, this man. Um, and there are these really touching scenes as he sort of, we sort of learn a little bit more about his character. And then at the end of the book, it sort of splits into um, sort of three different perspectives, Penelope being one of them again. And there's something so clever and human about the observations of this. She's she's quite spare almost with words at times. She moves quite quickly through through scenes and through moments and then lingers. And there's a real pacing thing that's kind of beautiful here that she has this really interesting insight into how she observes lives. And I just thought it was a really beautiful tale and, and so well done as well. Next up was a recommendation I had from Kit, um, and that is Genderqueer, a memoir by Maya Kobabe. And um, Kit had mentioned this when there was a, a sort of booktube uh, gathering thing in London. Um, and so I got to meet Kit for the first time in person, which was lovely. Um, and uh, they spoke about this book. We were in Gaze the Word in London and uh, they said, oh, uh, this this book is incredible. And I, <laughs> it was sort of the shortest turnover from oh yeah, check out this book, to me actually ending up buying it. It sort of went straight into the list and I thought, yes. Uh, so it's a it's sort of done as a sort of graphic novel sort of style um, and it talks about uh, Maya uh, uh, Maya's life and particularly working out gender identity, working out what that means, um, how Maya kind of navigates the world um, and the various complicated relationships that he have with, uh, that, that he has with, um, with, uh, gender, with sexuality, with um, their with with their body, and with so many other things, and I just thought it was really beautifully done. It's uh, you know with graphic novels often they can be fairly quick reads, but this one really sort of lingered for me, um, despite that, because of just how tender it is. It, it really goes into really quite profound conversations around what it means to define outside of something kind of quote unquote more normal or regular but also how relationships with bodies and uh and with expectations of those bodies can be so harmful you know Maya spends so much of this book talking about how to reconcile a body that doesn't feel quite right to you um uh, but also at the same time kind of goes into real depth about um, sort of moments of joy and euphoria and I think it's just so so beautiful in, in so many ways. Before I go into the two book of books from this year's long list uh, I've sort of mentioned before that I'm obviously my sort of longer term project is reading all of the book of short lists. Um, I'm trying to finish the winners this year and uh, Graham Swift's Last Orders which won in 1996 was the most recent that I read um, and this I thought was really quite beautiful. I've, I've really enjoyed a couple of Graham Swift's, uh, Swift's Graham Swift's books before, um, namely uh, Mothering Sunday, which I really enjoyed, and um, Waterland, which I just thought was it was exceptional. Um, and Last Orders, I, 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 you know, I maybe don't love as much as Waterland, but I did really love Waterland. Um, but for me, Last Orders, I think, is so special in, in many ways as well. So it's this sort of group of uh, essentially working class men from a certain era, um, and one of them has died. Uh, and so the others come together to really process his death and to think about how to do his, to, you know, to undergo his last orders, which were around scattering his ashes. And in the meantime, we have this group of men um, and a sort of former friend and sort of potential lover of his all kind of coming together to make this happen. But I think what's really brilliant about the way this book does this, and I can see why it won perhaps for this, is the way it's really able to capture a certain group of men who grew up in a very specific time for whom um, talking about emotions was not really a thing and how they deal with the death of a close friend whilst also not really being the right people to talk about these things. You know, they, they start to have conversations and it comes out all wrong and they maybe act in ways that seem foolish or, or what have you. Um, and they can't quite seem to piece those things together. And so sometimes they'll have these lengthy conversations about work or about um, really technical details of engineering or, or whatever, um, instead of having the conversation. Um, and so I thought this was really, it, it kind of, it reminds me of some men I know in in my family and sort of that I've met before, 
um, where you don't really talk about things. Um, and so there's a real tenderness that is underlying this novel that I thought was really quite clever um, and, and really quite quite profound as well. Um, I will say it didn't always fully whoop, in books there. Didn't always fully work for me. I think overall I really enjoyed his story. I didn't necessarily get that punch that I really needed to take it to the next level, but I, I still think this is a, a really beautiful novel nonetheless. And last but not least, a couple of Booker books. And so I've done solo reviews of these, which uh, will well, this, the first one's already gone up, which is my review of Sarah Bernstein's Study for Obedience, uh, which I think is a really profound novel. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a challenging read in, in some ways because it does meander. It's kind of a book that sort of goes off on its own little rabbit holes and journeys and it doesn't necessarily have this sort of plot that takes you from A to B in a really concrete way but essentially she is a our, our narrator is an outsider who has come to this place because her brother was here and it's sort of you know at times feels a lot like a place we kind of uh know and we keep on just being told it's up north um and the the people around write in this sort of these sort of runes, this sort of runic script, basically. And they have these conversations and she doesn't really understand things. But she is an outsider, not only because of that, but also there's a sort of lingering sense of anti-Semitism that, that lingers in how the book, uh, you know, how she moves through the world. So she often talks about how she can feel herself potentially being judged in advance. And I think the real clever trick of this book is that there are times where because she doesn't speak the language, this other group is entirely a set of outsiders for her. But equally, she maybe is misreading that entire situation. We never, a lot of the things they do or say aren't distinctly cruel or unfair. She perhaps perceives that she's been left out of things, but she's also aware that she doesn't really know the lay of the land. And so she may be getting it all wrong. And I think that's where this book is really strong. It's incredibly creepy and uh, there's this real this real tension and sort of lingering feeling throughout the book that something's quite off um, and I think that's the, the real strength of this book as well. I've got a longer review on it um, but I think that's sort of a, a short version of, of my sort of thoughts on this book. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think it's incredibly strong in many ways. And so last but not least the other book a book that I read uh, this week which is Prophet Song by Paul Lynch and uh, I've got a separate review on this. It's a bit of a, a at times I think I've maybe misunderstood parts of this book, but I think overall a really powerful and punchy read. It focuses on a sort of, essentially it takes the sort of the, a sort of modern day uh, migrant story of somebody fleeing, uh, fleeing persecution and fleeing um, a sort of dystopian government. And it maps it onto Irish people moving from Ireland to the UK. And so there's something baked in there about obviously Ireland's history with the, the UK is already fraught and complicated, um, to say the least. Uh, and I think um, this book kind of takes that and really runs with it. And I think as a result, there's this really, it's a bit of a brute force book in some ways. It's so relentlessly full of of sort of the, the, these dark moments and I mean the, the cover in some ways gives you a real sense of the the general color palette of this of this book um it's very it's very dark it's full of a lot of really quite horrendous things happening and within all of that is something I think quite tricky that this book kind of is dealing with a woman whose husband has been taken um because you know he's a trade unionist and he's suspected of being dangerous um but equally some other sort of more nefarious things are going on and so her only real way through this is sort of to try and escape out the other side alive and with as much humanity intact as she can the book is also a bit brute force in terms of how it writes so quite often you get pages like this with very few line breaks not really any breaks for um for kind of dialogue or anything or even punctuation marks so often the dialogue all happens within this big wall of text and I get that that's sort of partly a form and function thing like that it's meant to feel so overwhelming that a punctuation mark would almost you know uh, you know it, it's almost like the punctuation mark would kind of break up this sort of wall of of text I think as a reader that doesn't always make the most pleasurable experience but I'm you know I'm willing to kind of roll with that to some degree actually my my crit my sort of critique I guess would be that I'd want it to go further 
um, that I'd want it to completely break language uh, within the, the text because I think it's still written in a fairly sort of somewhat standard if slightly more brutal version I almost want it to really kind of go full in like Emma McBride's um, Girl is a Half-Formed Thing maybe not to that extreme actually but something like that where it really breaks language and so that was my main critique but I think overall I think this book is has a lot going for it and is an incredibly powerful book um, it's just a lot <laughs> <laughs> so be warned uh but but there we go um and so those have been the books that i've i've read this this week and they've been some fun ones um some quite dense ones uh but i've really enjoyed them so uh i hope you've had a really good reading week take care and speak to you all soon bye bye